This is the Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show. It's a show full of informative chat and inspirational messages. The Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show on podcast. Hello, welcome to Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show. I'm your host, Claire, and we've got an important mission this month. It is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. And we're shedding light on a crucial issue. Brain tumors claim more lives among children and adults under 40 than any other cancer. Shockingly, only 1% of the national spend on cancer research is allocated to this silent threat. Shall we go back to 2004 and what were your symptoms that led you to getting your diagnosis? Oh, uh, yeah, there wasn't really... Much basically, if we go back to the previous year, my my brother did mention to me that he seems like, or I've been mentioning that I've been getting headaches, and I didn't think much of it at all. I was working a lot. In fact, in April, I was involved in a project sequencing the SARS genome that led to worldwide headlines. Mm. I was spending a lot of um, time with work and this side thing. And part of the reason I'm spending a lot of time at work is I had the time because I broke up with my girlfriend the previous year. And the, that in itself was actually quite uh, hard for me. It was some a relationship that I ended, but which then subsequently really regretted. And sometimes I find that had a negative effect on my brain. But yeah, other than the headaches throughout 2003, one other thing is in February of 2004, early February, I had a work trip in Marco Island, Florida, and during that conference, in one of the breaks, I went to do a nice walk on the, the beach. And it's hard to describe it. One way I just describe it is it's at one point, it suddenly felt like one of my legs, my right leg, I think it was, kind of turned like jello. It was just, a, I didn't fall, but there was this, this extremely weird sensation. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I thought, okay, I'll just kind of take care of this when I get back home. Um, but in retrospect, that could have been, um, a, a partial seizure. Um, but other than those two things, there wasn't really any other in, in fact, back then I was quite an ice hockey player. Of course I'm, I'm Canadian, so you kind of have to be an ice hockey player. Yeah. And in fact, on a Saturday night was the last game of the season for our team. In that on that Saturday night, I actually had the best. If you count goals, I've had the best, the most I've scored in a game. I got five goals on a Saturday night game, last game of the season. And basically, a day and a half later, Monday morning, uh, I collapsed into a grand mal seizure, and I was out of it. I didn't, I kind of came out of it this drug-induced state a day and a half later at the hospital. It took me a while to to hit me what exactly happened. Apparently, in the ambulance, they were put a line in me, I guess, to get some fluids, but they punctured my right lung. Oh. And and actually, I when I came out of this state a day and a half later at the hospital, I had a lot of pain on my right side where the lungs were. And it, I don't know, I think it maybe was up to two days where I th I thought that's why I was in the hospital for that reason. And it wasn't at some point a neurosurgeon or neuro, neuro oncologist came by and just matter of factly said, just, just said, so you have a brain tumor. And that hit me. I'm like, what? And I'm looking at my parents. What? And it, but it turned out that was like about the sixth or seventh time I was told that. So it didn't hit me for a while mm. under drugs and the pain in my chest. How old were you then? I, at that point, I was 29. I was, I was young and <laughs> had all the time in the world. Mm. So, so I guess it's kind of part of my story. So I was young and had all the time in the world and maybe that's why I broke up with who I was with thinking I don't want to commit I have 
for all long life to live. And now everything changed. I thought, okay, I don't necessarily have a long life to live. What was the plan for you treatment wise? So the first thing they did is a biopsy. So that that was kind of done before any treatment came, a biopsy that determined what it was in my brain. Could it have been a, a, just a, a tumor, but it could be a benign tumor. I don't know. <laughs> so after de- doing the biopsy and uh, a- analysis basically led to the diagnosis of grade four astrocytoma mm-hmm. or GBM with a little bit of oligodendroglioma. Mm-hmm. How uh, did you cope with that? Well, I don't when know. You're not, I think because I had a, a lot of drug in me, I don't think it quite hit me. It definitely hit my mom. <laughs> yeah. She was beyond devastated. Um, I, I kind of remained positive from day one. Apparently I was making jokes with the nurses and, and so I'll, I'll back up again to 2003. I actually, I played a huge role and made, made headlines with it, sequencing the SARS genome. Yeah. But I was overall, I was a little, a little bit depressed and, and I felt stuck in my life. And after I got this cancer, I did not have a common response of why me? I had a response of, oh, okay, that makes sense now. That's why I've been depressed or whatever it it felt like it was i so into i felt like i needed to do to change something in 2003 i just was not happy and like when this cancer came i was like okay i didn't make any changes in my life so someone made this this change for me Mm -hmm. it was almost almost like it was setting me on a, a different path which is what i needed and and it was a bit of a it sounds really corny to say, and no, nah, it's probably not accurate to say there was a sigh of relief, but there was definitely a sigh of, of a feeling of that, okay, this makes sense. There mm-hmm. wasn't any feeling of why me, why did I get it? There was more feeling of, okay, this makes sense. I think I knew one key is I'll say, so I've heard many stories worries of brain cancer patients seeing their doctor and being told they're not going to live long or emphasizing the bad prognosis. But my journey did the surgery. He was a bit of a genius. Basically, he didn't say that. He What he did is he drew on a, a board, a, a big, like a chart showing a decrease in survive, survival over time. But he emphasized that line going down doesn't hit the bottom. It it kind of hovers over, showing that not everyone passes away early on. Mm. And he just said, he goes, there's no reason you can't be here. You can't be. And he went way down on the chart, like way down where it was very low. But he, like I said, it didn't hit the bottom. There were long-term survivors. And he said, there's no reason you can't be one of them. Yeah, which that he was right. Did you go yeah. back? Do you still, is he still part of your treatments or is you haven't spoken to him again? Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, he was a neurosurgeon. Mm-hmm. So after surgery and starting treatment, he wasn't involved in any radiation and chemotherapy or any of that. He wasn't, but we were in touch. And in, in fact, it, you can actually see him somewhere on my website, but we were in touch. But then he eventually moved to another place in the States. I think he, he left the, the left Vancouver. So yeah. he wasn't around anymore. Do you think he gave you the hope that you needed? Yes, what he said, that was huge, even though it's, that was huge for me. Mm-hmm. And I think for my family to, to and so the irony in my case, like I said, was working on the SARS, but that was part of the Cancer Institute. I actually started off as a cancer researcher in 2000. And four years later, this happened. And I know I'm diverging a bit, which is my habit, <laughs> but basically, I did not have experience or knowledge of brain cancer, though. Mm. 
And so definitely what he said was very impactful, even just on an unconscious level that I took that in. And then I had two more things that happened very early on, and both of them were very powerful dreams. And during my fourth week and sixth week of treatment, and basically those powerful dreams told me I was going to be fine, that I was going to live. And even before, by the time I finished treatment, I was, I had no worry or no feeling of issues. And maybe that's why actually even getting, before getting the results of the treatment, I went on a dating site, I ended up meeting someone and we ended up getting married a year later and yeah. So you were living your life as you were. So it sounds like kind of that chemical of positivity in your brain has made a difference. I don't know if that has, but the fact that the, the person that you met originally, he gave you hope, then you've met somebody and it shows that life can still go on and good things will still happen to you. But have you ever gone through times where it wasn't easy, like where you were doing, you were having chemotherapy, radio, uh, radiation? What was that like for you? Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, no, it wasn't easy. That That's for sure. I could no longer take the chemotherapy even after just two weeks. It just really, my body can handle it. And, and I was went back and forth to the hospital and at one point I had to have transfusions because my blood counts went in super, super low and the radiation ended up um, really affecting my senses and things had strong smell. And in fact, I joked with my mom that I had psychic smell because one time I was over and hanging out in the living room, and then I, I could smell lentil. She was making lentil soup. I could smell it. <laughs> just called out and said, oh, can I have some of the soup? <laughs> when, And she just came in the living room. Oh, I, I said, can I have some of the lentil soup? Because that's what I smelled. She just came, kind of almost came into the living room in a bit of shock, and she goes, I haven't made soup. And I'm like, oh, I can totally smell lentil soup. And she said... <laughs> She just grabbed the bag to make it, <laughs> but she hadn't made it yet. <laughs> Had you lost any? Um, so where you'd done this, did you lose any of your senses in any way? Because you know how sometimes you lose one thing and the others hype up a bit. So noise or things I like that. I guess I didn't. One of my senses is the hearing in my left side is, is quite compromised. I don't remember feeling or noticing that right away back then the my sense of taste changed a bit and yeah my sense of smell seemed like off the roof mm. it, it seemed to really be quite powerful i remember i smelled like a, a beer brewery that's actually quite a ways away <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah so how is it that you had radiotherapy chemo but you didn't have to have yeah. any surgery yeah. the whole of these 20 years yeah, they felt that the tumor was in a really difficult spot that, and they knew what I did for work. And they felt if they did a surgery, they negatively affect too much that, that it might affect me, my ability to do what I was doing for work. Mm -hmm. And, but what we did is we sent the uh, MRI s slides to three other hospitals throughout in North America. And basically all of them, except one, said they fully agree with our decisions here. Except one place said we typically do surgery. That's what we almost always do. But we still, we agree with you guys. We see the reason you don't want to do it in your case. Basically, we had confirmation from a number of places to just go ahead without surgery. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of having brain surgery, I actually had something happen to me in 2020. I had what's called a subdural hematoma, and that's basically blood came a, a vessel, blood vessel burst, and there's blood between my brain and the skull. 
and it, this was actually a long term. The damage to the blood cell was a long term effect of the radiation that, that I had. Mm. And it's, the hope was that my brain would absorb the blood, which didn't happen. So I actually did have brain surgery in 2020 to deal with that blood. But th this was not a recurrence of the cancer. So that's good. Yeah. I think I missed another part of your question. Um, so another thought of mine is unlike unlike cancer and the rest of the body where you can, the surgery is kind of an easier option because it might not affect the body so much. You can have a part here or there removed, mastectomy, whatnot. But with something in the brain, you just have to be extremely careful. It can never remove the whole tumor from the brain because the problem with brain cancer, especially GBM, it, it, it really is immersed, especially on the, the edges of the tumor, it's really immersed within normal cells. If you were to uh, do a surgery to try and get the whole thing out of there, it is a very high chance you know, there will be negative effects on the brain, mm -hmm. which is why typically there is surgery to get the bulk of it out, but then the chemo and radiation will deal with the remaining cells. In my case, I did have a recurrence in 2006, and I went back on the, exact, the same chemotherapy, but a lower dosage and over a long period of time, and that that was a success. What was the chemo that you were having? It's called temozolomide. Because of how long it, ago it, it was, is... were you on a trial for the temozol? No. Oh. So I got lucky in that, that was 20 years ago, and, and believe it or not, it's still the standard, that particular drug. Mm. I got lucky because it was just coming out. There was a, a, a study, a protocol called the Stoop protocol, which showed that when you take the drug during radiation, there's a slightly better effect. Um, and at the time, it was just coming out. Like, we're told you have to pay for it, which is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But somehow it, it got dealt with because it just was coming out back then. So... With any cancer, and again, although in this case, especially with GBM, when you're given the chemotherapy, like I said, uh, almost always is this, the first treatment is temozolomide, but when you're given to it, it's going to kill cells mm -hmm. that are sensitive to it. A person's going to have radiation chemo, the, the, the tumor's going to shrink. Um, then is often a recurrence and what the recurrence is is this any cells remaining that were resistant to the temozolomide now they start multiplying and grow and now the tumor comes back but the tumor even could look the same very similar be in the exact spot it's genetically quite different and that's why often the temozolomide would not work a second time because those cells are resistant to temozolomide, and that's why they continue to, uh, to grow into a new tumor. Mm -hmm. In my case, I potentially did not have a scenario where the tumor shrunk from treatment, and then there was now new resistant cells to the temozolomide because I actually stopped temozolomide quite early because I was so sensitive. The radiation shrunk my tumor, and then when it recurred and grown back, I think those cells, the tumor cells, were still similar to the initial tumor. So that's why the temozolomine worked the second time after my recurrence. But like I said, mentioned before, we did it one week per month at a lower dosage so my body was able to take it mm. and uh, it it worked yeah have you had any reoccurrences since 2006 no how does that feel to do you, do you just get on with your life now or do you just I have it on think, your mind all the I, yeah i actually think i don't have it on my mind enough i've gotten so used to it that i don't really think about it and sometimes i almost have to shake myself up and say come on man you've 
past the odds and like we on days when i don't know i still have one side effect of the cancer is a bit of fatigue and i might feel fatigued one day and just kind of feel a bit down and i i think so i have to kind of remind myself that statistically i shouldn't be alive mm -hmm. so just enjoy every moment you have with whatever and so it's actually more i i kind of forget or i, I in a way i have kind of moved forward with things and kind of it's hard to explain that there's full knowledge always on that the brain can have side effects double vision and hearing issues and my balance is isn't great do you think that's from the drugs or no, do you think that's from the tumor oh, no it's from the radiation it's the radiation. That's why my hearing is compromised because that's the bulk of where the most of the radiation went. It's affected my balance and caused a double vision because it damaged the optical nerves. That's all from radiation. Mm. Yeah. What do you do in your daily life? In that, do you are you keeping fit all the time? Are you a healthy person? What would you think is the difference between? I like to be healthier, <laughs> but I'm quite careful. I do try and eat quite healthy. I do take some supplements. I don't eat junk food very rarely. Do you avoid certain things that are considered as feeding cancer a little bit? Or do you, you just haven't had to, you haven't done that? I avoid some foods for other reasons, mm -hmm. nothing to do with feeding the cancer. I do love steak. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I do, but I'm thankfully, I really love salmon and I do try and eat a lot of fish and salmons, you get your omega threes and thankfully I, I love salmon. So that, that's a good thing, mm -hmm. but I, I don't, there's not, there's actually nothing I avoid thinking it's not good for the cancer. I do have some things I avoid for other reasons, but I just try and eat healthy in general. Mm -hmm. And when in, in my head, I'm, I'm thinking more just to be healthy, not thinking about, okay, if eat healthy, the cancer won't come back. Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's just not my way of thinking about it. I just want to be healthier. Uh, and in fact, right now I'm going to the gym and, and, and I'm really trying to be healthy and get in better shape. But it, my motivation actually is, is more that I just want to be around for my uh, daughter as she gets old and I want to be healthy. And it, it's in my view, the cancer is gone, long gone. But I guess I, I'm just trying to do certain exercises and be healthier and hopefully that'll help things of my balance and other issues like that. Did you have to explain things to your daughter or did you, again, because you're not having to deal with it right now, you didn't need to really tell her anything because there's nothing to tell her. Yeah, she's, it's an interesting question, not interesting, it's a good question because there is a very specific moment in 2015 when she was seven years old. She'll be 16 in a couple of months, but back in 2005, was, she was seven and I was given an award for my contributions to my volunteer contribution to the brain cancer world in Canada. I was given an award mm -hmm. and at the presentation of the award, I guess I'd never, my daughter never knew and never told her, but at the presentation of the award. I did a little speech and whatnot. Then everyone kind of, you know, got mingled around with snacks and treats and drinks and whatever. And I'll never forget the moment she just, my daughter came to me and she, she says, she goes, so you had cancer? And I, even now, I just get a bit emotional. Mm. I'll never forget that moment. Did it actually make her think, wow, that's my dad that's done that? So I think at that point back then, she may have not thought that. It was probably just hitting her that yeah. and maybe she wasn't fully understanding of what cancer was. Like I said, she was she would have been seven. 
But I think over the years, yeah, she knows. I just found out, oh, I don't know when, maybe a few months ago, she shared my website with her friends, something like that. She's looked at it. She she knows. So I, I do think she's recognizes what I've been through. And it's very fascinating in that sometimes I feel that I, my daughter's amazing. I love her a bit, as most dads probably do. Sometimes I think if I didn't get cancer, she might not be here mm. because of the fact that it was the cancer when I got it. Like I had mentioned earlier, because of that, I felt, okay, get you need to move forward in life, meet someone, have kids, whatever. And I went on a dating website and... If I never got that cancer, I may not have gone on the dating website and, and met who I met. So it's very fascinating to me in a way because I'm so I'm quite a thinker. <laughs> yeah, I have so many theories and stuff and why this happened is meant to happen. I, I am writing a memoir uh. so that 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 gets out all my these kind of thoughts. It's taken way too long, but it's. I'm getting there and my writing is getting better than when I first started. So that's good. And it's going to be a quite a, a unique memoir in terms of being from someone who's lived for now over 20 years. I liked almost every book out there I could find written by brain tumor, brain cancer survivors. Most of them are written fairly quickly after diagnosis. Which I'm very impressed with. I don't know how people do it, but mine's can be quite unique because it's it, it's been so long since diagnosis. So I mentioned the journey uh, of a long-term survivor. Mm. Do you ever get survival mm -hmm. guilt? Yeah. How does it, like why? I, Just I don't know if I have survival yeah. guilt. Something I don't know if I have survival guilt. I sometimes yeah. think, why me <laughs> when I had it? So. Yeah, I often say that when I got the cancer, I didn't have a, I didn't experience a, why me? Why did I get the cancer? No, but I have more the, why me? Why did I get it in terms of why have I survived and so many don't? But yeah, I have asked that. I have some deep theories, which I'm struggling with how to express that in my memoir. But in general, sometimes I wonder. I did once, once I approached a teacher and asked him, well, why have I survived? And he just said, because you have a reason to be here on this. Uh, you're not done in a way. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Well, there's it, definitely it was, a difference between... It was something. Yeah, but there's definitely a difference between the people who have had enough and they don't want to carry on. And then the person that... I think what you said when you went back to the beginning and you said how you had some really positive things to start with to get you in a positive way at the beginning. I wouldn't be surprised if it just... I unconscious... Or subconsciously, I don't know. But I took it in without even thinking about it, mm -hmm. that it, it had a bigger effect than it maybe I even thought at the time. Yeah. Just showing this chart and showing it, he, he added a couple of things. He goes, you're young, you're in really good shape. And I was at that point. And he basically said, there's no reason you can't be way over here. And that little thing, mm -hmm. yes, I, I think that, that triggered triggered a deep death. So there's a lot of people ask me, what did you do to survive? How mm -hmm. come? I think having a positive, not just a more and more than just having hope. I think having a very strong fe feeling inside that you will survive can actually have a positive effect on the brain. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do think I, I am a believer as a, a scientist and quite a spiritual person that we can affect our brain cells with thoughts. Mm -hmm. But then if it's even deeper, like unconscious thoughts, it, it can have a profound effect, I believe. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I was part of my uh, reason to be here, to reason I'm living is to help others and help others deal with what I've already kind of been there, done that, I, that I've dealt with it myself. And I'm obligated to help others now. Mm -hmm. 
Is there anyone that whilst the whole, you know, the last 20 years that you want to, is there anyone you want to say thank you to that's gone through this journey with you? I will <laughs> mention one thing. My wife and I got, eventually we got divorced. Uh -huh. I'm a single dude now. So if you know any women in the UK that want to meet a guy, <laughs> I'm single. Okay, there you go, everybody. <laughs> anyway. A bachelor. <laughs> ready. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I can get emotional. Um, I always my think, mom. Yeah. Oh, our mom. She has... She's just been there for you the whole way through, hasn't she? So from the beginning. I always think, because we never... The whole I don't, way through. Yeah. When I came out of... When I came out of a drug and do state at the hospital... Mm. The first thing I remember is wet cloth on my mouth because it got all dry. That was her. Aww. And she had, when I was younger, quite a bit younger, she had two types of cancer, breast cancer and then cancer of the ovaries. And she survived. She passed away two years ago as complications from diabetes. But she was my inspiration. That's amazing. I, that must be just something in your genes that's just... It can cope with things like that that others can't. Yeah, it's, when you talk about genes, it's interesting because it was part of a study. There's a small group of brain cancer folks who they can get a certain mutation from their mom who's had breast cancer. So I had my my DNA tested to see if I have this mutation. And I was really hoping I did not, because mm. then if I did, I wouldn't tell my mom. But if she found out, she'd almost probably feel guilty. Mm. Uh, thankfully, I did not have the, that mutation. So the reason I got brain cancer had nothing to do genetically from that I got from my mom, thankfully. But even during over the years, that was for me part of it, that I, I had to survive. For my mom's sake, mm. if I passed away, she can live. It, it, no. <laughs> yeah. So you just had I so had many to, things so... to live for. Yeah. Is there anything um, you would advise to other people that have recently got diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, the biggest thing is to just envision yourself healthy. Envision the can that the cancer is gone. Like deep down, go to bed, tell yourself the cancer is gone. Envision that it's gone. Don't just think, I hope it goes or hope this treatment works. Actually know within yourself the treatment did it, your mind did it, dealt with it, the cancer is gone. And just deep down, make that part of your soul. And I do think that will have a positive uh, effect in your in your brain and in terms of the neuroplasticity actually create new can, new cells that are not cancerous the other thing is i have all this stuff on my website but <laughs> early on maybe within a year or two years after i got the cancer i taught myself how to do the rubik's cube and not more just I was just very curious. I remember back then thinking, can I even create new memories? Can I, am I going to just, is this how I'm going to be the rest of my life? Just, and so I taught myself how to do the Rubik's Cube. And then it, it, as each month that came, without thinking about it at all in between, I did it again mm -hmm. just to see. And it, I might have to relearn some things, but over time, I realized I do it one month, the next month goes by, and I can do it again. And that taught me, okay, obviously, I can create new brain cells in even in this state of having brain cancer. And that was a bit of an eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. And it was, and what I get, what the lesson I get out of that is. One thing, uh, I'll say two more things, is to try new things because that, that'll have very positive effects to try new things. Read a new type of book, read 
learn a certain dance, just just try new things, which is just really good for the brain, and I think not good for the cancer. <laughs> and I forgot what my second thing I was gonna say. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But yeah, just trying new things is really good. Oh, and it, okay, the second thing is find a reason or a purpose that you need to be here. You get the cancer, life's feels like life's over, or life has done a complete 180 and everything's different. What's the point? This is it can be easy to give up or think, what am I gonna do now? But if you always, if you create in yourself, because it's a reason you have to live for your kids, for your wife, for your husband, take that and make it deep down in your soul that you have to be here. And I think that that helps too. Yeah. Thank you very much for just sharing your story. And you are really inspiring. I, I really appreciate it. For sure. Nice to chat. Very and much. you. Yeah. Thank you very Great. much. This is the Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show. It's a show full of informative chat and inspirational messages. The Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show on podcast.